Thank you for watching Friendship Community Church Sermons on Demand. We're pleased you have decided to view our pulpit messages. Our Sermons on Demand are a ministry of Friendship Community Church and are provided as a resource to anyone who desires to study the Word of God. So open your Bible and get ready to dig into the Word of God and see what God has for you today. Anyway, it is a really good morning because Rich is home. Uh, I was kind of, morning, brother. Um, it's just, we were so tickled to hear that he was on his way home. I knew that would wipe him out for the rest of that day. Linda says, uh, as he gets up and makes a trip from one room to another, that's about a half a day's work. You know, he'll go one room to another and he's down for hours. Here comes Lesson Joanne now. Good. Good. So we're so happy and so glad you're home, brother. Uh, brought a tear to everybody's eyes. It, it, was, it hurt us. I'm talking to Rich, and, and you guys can listen, and that's got nothing to do with Sunday school. It hurt us to see where you were. I, I can't describe the pain that we felt to see our beloved pastor and shepherd in that kind of condition. And so it just tells us what a, what a great and awesome God we worship that, that brought him through this and brought him home. So we're so glad you're there, brother. Okay, so I'm thinking about Sunday school this morning uh, and what I'm going to do. And it makes me remember here somewhere. <clears throat> Kate? There it is. I got it. Oh, back, back I say. Back. Oh, that's a sensitive little booger. Michelle and I are going to Vermont Wednesday. <laughs> going to Vermont Wednesday afternoon, getting in Wednesday evening and staying through next Monday. Now, that's what I'm saying. Who in their right mind goes to Vermont the end of November? I would kind of hope it would look something like this. However, I'm afraid that instead of gold leaves and a clear sky, it's going to be all white. But at any rate, it ought to be really pretty. It ain't uh, buffalo that you can see. It ain't, there. yeah, that's right. It ain't buffalo. Why would anybody do that to, to spend Thanksgiving with Michelle's family? I must really love my wife a bunch. So uh, there, you, there you go. That's where we're going. You know, when the holidays are coming on us, I don't know about you guys, but we get Christmas lists from our kids, for the kids and the grandkids every year. And I think that's common. People compile Christmas lists and they compile New Year's resolutions. Uh, when I was looking around, at, at, I decided I'd talk about Thanksgiving some today. When I was looking at Thanksgiving stuff, I came upon a little list that some housewives made of things that they are thankful for. Okay, and so I thought I'd share a couple of those with you. It's just part of the list. There were housewives that said that they were especially thankful for husbands who attack small repair jobs around the house because they usually mess them up so big they need to call in the professionals. <laughs> Sounds right. They're especially thankful for children who pick up and clean up after themselves. But it's really sad when they have to send them back to their own houses. <laughs> They're really thankful for teenagers because it gives them the opportunity to learn a second language. Ooh. And a standing joke around the Goebel house, they're thankful for smoke alarms because it lets you know when dinner is done. <laughs> what do you think, honey? That's a long-standing Goebel joke. We, uh, anyway, we won't even get there. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. But if, if we made a list of things to be thankful for, our list may not be that way, but, but I'm sure we would include things like major things in life, like thankful for life, thankful for our health, thankful for our family, thankful for our friends, and despite all the problems we have, I think you join me in being thankful for the nation that we live in, I, comparatively speaking. 
But even more than that, I'm thankful for our church. I'm thankful for our church family. I'm thankful for the mercy that God shows us every day. I'm thankful for my salvation. You know, you think about things going on and health issues and things. Aren't you, aren't you happy and thankful to know where you're going to be for eternity? So there are things we need to be thankful for. But again, I looked at Thanksgiving, and I got into a little bit of Thanksgiving history. Um, and we're just going to touch on a couple of those things. Uh, supposedly, uh, you know, historically, Thanksgiving is said to have originated at Plymouth Rock in 1621. All right, that's when they had the first Thanksgiving. Do you remember that? Pardon? <laughs> Do I remember that? He's heard me tell the stories. <laughs> he said supposedly. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. It's prematurely gray. Uh, you know, if you think about it, what did the pilgrims and, the, and the, the people at Plymouth Rock have to be thankful for? They were probably the most underprivileged folks that have ever lived in this nation. They had no houses to speak of. They had no government to build them a house and give them one. Yeah. <laughs> They had no means of transportation except for their legs. They had no means of communication except how far they could shout. So they couldn't talk to their relatives in Europe where they came from. Um, they had no Medicare. They had no Social Security. They had no welfare. I mean, and yeah. And you know, I, I read another thing that said they even dug more graves than the number of new houses they built. Pretty sad. They didn't have any money, and if they had it, they had no place to spend it. So, you know, their only food came from the ocean or the land, and they had to go get it. They had to go get it. So what did they have to be thankful for in materialistic things? You know, none that we know of, but they were thankful for the freedom to exercise their religion. They were thankful for those major things that we said. They decided that they needed to, to stop and give a day of thanks to the Almighty God that brought them there. Uh, gee, if they can do that, why can't we? You know, why can't we be that thankful? Uh, you know, our forefathers had what's called a boundless faith in God, and that's the basis on which our country was founded. Uh, I'm, I'm in the process of reading a book, Dan may be aware of it, I know Rich has read it, called The 5,000-Year Leap. Yeah, I'm, I'm only through about the first hundred pages of that, but the first hundred pages of this book, and, and it's about, how would you summarize what that book is, Dan, the whole, the whole book, about the tenets of the Constitution and where uh, the, idea that the if basic we principles. In God's way, we will have amazing uh, success because God, after all, wants us to succeed. He's given us the plan for how to do it. If we just wait for these little evolutionary steps, it'll take forever. If we do it his way, it happens almost all at once. Yeah, yeah the first hundred pages especially concentrate on the fact of how rooted our, our founding fathers were in how important religion and morality was to making this new concept of, of this nation work. If any, uh, the author is Cleon Skousen, W. Cleon Skousen. Okay. Cleon. Yeah. Yeah, um, what planet was he from? No, it's not a planet. Well, not a Klingon. I gave everybody a copy of that book. Who did? Well, that's probably where the one came from that I, because I didn't buy it. Yeah. So, <laughs> we, we, my dad and I, we were very impressed with it. So we got a whole bunch of them. Just to them. Yeah. 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 Well, you'll be happy to know that I'm reading it. <laughs> it didn't go to waste. It didn't go for kindling in the fire. I'm actually reading it. But... That, like I say, it's a, it's a great book about, about our founding fathers and what the principle was. And if you look back into our documents, Dan and I were joking this morning about, unfortunately, our Constitution, a lot of other documents are just papers in an archive now without a lot of meaning. But if you look back into our documents, I would really want to read some quotes from a couple of the things that we learned in school that we may have forgotten what they were there for. And these are some bits and pieces, obviously. I'm not going to read the whole document. But the Declaration of Independence says, 
we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable lights, rights. And it ends the declaration with these words, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The Declaration of, Independ of Independence talks about the creator and divine providence. You know, Thanksgiving is kind of a distinctive holiday. It doesn't celebrate a birthday. You know, we have all the president's birthdays. We have anniversaries. Um, it's not a big battle. It's not D-Day. It's not any of those things. It was just initially set aside as a day to express our nation's thanks to our nation's God. In 1789, George Washington made the first public proclamation about Thanksgiving. Now, I'm just going to read a part of this, but here's George Washington's proclamation. By the President of the United States of America, a proclamation, whereas it's the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress, can you believe that? Both houses of Congress have by their joint committee requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many signal flavors or favors of Almighty God now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be. That's the first Thanksgiving declaration by George Washington. How far have we come? How far have we come? There's another, you know, we jump another 75 years or so. There's another Thanksgiving quote by Abraham Lincoln that, that uh, pretty much expressed where we were even, even in the mid-1800s, or at least where our leadership was. Lincoln said, The year that is drawing toward its close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties, which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come, Others have been added, which are of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even a heart which is habitually insensible to the ever-watchful providence of Almighty God. No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these th great things. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. That's where our leadership has been in the past. Look at where our leadership is today. Isn't that sad? I don't mean to be a downer on Thanksgiving, but as I read this, I'm going, wow, that's just sad. Okay, so this Thursday, it is Thanksgiving again. Uh, we would think that if we followed the example of our forefathers, uh, it would, we'd be an extremely thankful people. However, uh, I think we've gone the other way. I think the more we get, the less thankful we are, uh, and the less mindful of God is, we become, and the more we want. We become such a materialistic society. So as I looked, I'm going to share some Thanksgiving, some Thanksgiving stuff from the Bible with us. Um, one of, one of the most, I, I, I kept, as I looked at verses, I kept running into either this whole psalm or a verse over and over, and I went back, and it's a, it's a verse that, hello, it's a psalm, God bless you, all right, help me, Kate. There you go. It's Psalm 100, which kind of, to me, kind of sums up a lot of Thanksgiving. Now, I've, I've 
like I say, I kept finding it in all these verses, and because I was just going to do kind of a whole bunch of verses, and then I got looking into this, and I got looking into some commentary on it. And this is a psalm that I encountered when I was very young, and, and pretty much at that age, pretty much committed it to memory, and it's one of the things that stuck with me. And so we're going to talk about Psalm 100 today. Um, I put it up in the King James Version because that's the way I first read it. And that's the way I, I kind of memorized it. And frankly, I just kind of like the old ways sometimes. And I like the way it reads uh, in, in, uh, in the old King James Version. So let's read it. Let's read it together. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Now, just because we elders need to stick together, this is just for Dan. You want to hear it? <laughs> no, Dan, no, this, was just, this is just for you, my friends. <laughs> okay? This is Psalm 100 in, I guess, original Hebrew, Dan? It sure is. It is. So there you go. I did that just for Dan. Hebrew had a computer uh, <laughs> So there you, there you go. That's just for you, Dan. Yeah. It's all Greek to me. No, no, it's all Hebrew. <laughs> oh, all Hebrew to me. Okay, so take a look, Dan. It's going away. But that was that was just for you, my friend. I, I've still got it on the slide, but that was just for you. Okay. Um, it's it's a gorgeous psalm. Uh, it it really, when we think about it, this was really written for the people of Israel. You know, as as most psalms were. Um, you know, God was basically telling them, uh, you know, one day, you know, I'm, I'm going to lead you to the promised land. When you get there and you settle down in your house and you got plenty to eat, don't forget me. You know, don't forget to thank me. I'm the one who did that. I'm going to bring you or I've brought you to the land, as they say, with milk and honey. But we've already learned that, that uh, the people of Israel didn't really do that. They needed a reminder, and we probably do too. Um, now, if you think about it, maybe although this was written or inspired by God for the people of Israel, you think God had us in mind when he inspired this psalm as well? Look at who it's written to in the first verse. All ye lands. Not, not the people of Israel. All ye lands. And when? When should we do that? When was that appropriate? Look at the very end of the psalm. To all generations, to everybody and all generations at every stage of life. You know, it's kind of sad. As I looked, I was trying to see what other countries celebrate Thanksgiving. Canada celebrates Thanksgiving. Uh, Thanksgiving celebrated in the Philippines. It's Thanksgiving as we know it. There are, as I was looking, there are a bunch, when I came across lists of countries that have a Thanksgiving celebration, we're probably, those three are probably the only ones who have a true Thanksgiving to give thanks to the Almighty God. There are a ton of harvest days, feast days, whatever, jubilation days, whatever it is that people call Thanksgiving you know, and they may be thankful for a great harvest. It's not a true thanksgiving to, to our great and awesome God. That's kind of sad. You think if maybe that happened all around the world, we might have a little, a little uh, more unified place to live, and a little more peaceful place. Anyway, let's, let's talk about some other things. I think a danger... Uh, in, in this season is as a, kind of as I referred to before is people have a tendency to be thankful only for what they have 
you know, and they feel bad and they want more. And, you know, it's, oh, poor me, oh, poor me. You know, how can they be thankful because they don't have any money? So I was sitting around talking with a couple of my football buddies. We, we have an annual barbecue at the end of the year, and I was out at the guy's house that's doing the cooking. And I will confess, we sit there and tell war stories, football war stories. Uh, we tell some jokes as we're uh, watching the ribs and the chicken cook and having a cold beverage. Uh, and as we're telling the jokes, we're, you know, we also, one of the guys got one of those, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm so poor that, or we're so poor that, or blah, blah, blah. And I, I, I salvaged two of them. One guy says, he says, when, he said, you know, when I was growing up, he says, my family was so poor. He said, we went to KFC just to lick other people's fingers. <laughs> well, oh, okay. And another guy says, he says, you know, he says, we were so poor and our house was so small. He said, one day a guy came and knocked on the door and asked my mother, could I use the bathroom? And she said, sure, third tree on the right. It was <laughs> so well. <laughs> No, oh, you're shaking your head at me, honey. Uh, anyway, we don't want to determine that based on, on what we had. We, we, you know, we have a habit, though, of asking ourselves, do I have enough food, you know, this Thanksgiving or any time to gorge myself sufficiently? Do I have enough money in the bank? You know, how's my health? And we let those things determine whether we ought to give thanks or not. You know, the Bible tells us that all of that can vanish in a wisp. You know, those worldly possessions can drift away. They can burn up in a fire. We can, they can get stolen. Our health can falter, can it, brother? You and I certainly know that, and so does most everybody here who's had health issues. So those things are not what we need to be thankful for, what we need to be thankful for, and the only thing we can depend on is our relationship with the Lord. Okay, that's, that's the one true thing that we have that we can always be thankful for. Look at Psalm 100 again. Look at verse 1. We mentioned the Lord in verse 1. In verse 2, the Lord again in verse 2. In verse 3, we mentioned the Lord again. In verse 4, it's His gates with thanksgiving, His courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Verse 5, the Lord again. We can't, we can't get anything or do anything by ourselves. It's only with the Lord's mercies and the Lord's help. Speaking of help, I read another little thing. It was a story about Alex Haley. We know Alex Haley, the author of Roots. There was an interviewer interviewing Alex Haley. And they were at Haley's house or office or whatever. And they looked on the wall, and there's a picture on the wall of a fence post with a turtle sitting on top of the fence post. Okay. And, and the interviewer asked Haley, he said, you know, well, what, what's up with this picture? Does it have some kind of special meaning or something? And Alex Haley pretty much said, well, you know, Every now and then I write something and I'm really pleased with what I write and I get really proud and I think, aren't I wonderful and, and, you know, isn't this really good? And he says, and then I look up at that picture and he says, it reminds me that the turtle didn't get there on his own. He had help. And he said, I didn't do all of this on my own. I had help. That's, that's what we have. We have help through the Lord and we need to be thankful for that. And we're going to do, ooh, I know, I'm going a little long, honey, than I wanted. We're going to take a real quick, are you ready for this, Rich? We're going to take a real quick expository look at, I learned that from Rich. I didn't know that before I became a member here, what an expository look was. But we're going to take a real quick expository look at Psalm 100, okay? Because Psalm 100 actually gives us five commands. 
All right, the first command is make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. The meaning of that, a joyful noise. I mean, he wants us to shout. I read one uh, interpretation that said that verse means to sh that you should shout with your voice like the blast of a trumpet. You know, make it nice and loud. Uh, so, so that's what we should do. Um, maybe God has solved your problems. Maybe he's given you a direction. Maybe you've been blessed and finally realized that it came from God. So from the depths of your of your very soul, you need to proclaim the praise. I read another story. There's some really interesting stuff when you do a lot of this research. A guy that was a, a missionary named Roland Allen, who was a missionary to India and Africa around the turn of the century. And he tells a story of another missionary who came to him, a medical missionary, that came to, to, to Mr. Allen, and they were visiting after a message and this other missionary said, I've, I've got a story for you. He said, I was a medical missionary in India. And he said, the area that I was in, for some reason or another, there, all of the people were struck with a progressive blindness. And they were born with fine vision, but for some reason or another, because of whatever was in this particular area, as they got older, they would go progressive, more and more progressively blind until they would lose their sight completely. This doctor, this medical missionary, developed a treatment that would halt the effects of that. And so he began treating the people. And the people would come to him, and, and you know, when they realized they're going blind, they'd come to him, and, and they could retain their vision. And they realized that because of him, their sight had been saved. Now, the, this medical missionary told Mr. Allen, he said, you know, they didn't have the word thank you in their dialect, so they never thanked me. He said, however, they did have a word in their dialect, which meant, I will tell your name. And he said, wherever they went then, they would tell the name of the guy who had saved their sight. Okay. Okay. That's what this means. We need to tell the name of the Savior who has saved our lives. The second command, whoops, hello. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence. Well, the second command is actually serve the Lord with gladness. All right, it doesn't say serve the church. It doesn't say serve the elders. It doesn't say serve anybody else. It says serve the Lord. We serve the Lord. The Bible teaches us that if we witness on behalf of the Lord, if we feed the hungry, if we clothe the naked, if we do the work of the Lord, whatever it may be, we're serving the Lord. Matthew 25, 40 says, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. All right? I don't know whether we exactly grasp that. Uh, sometimes we do what we do out of a feeling of obligation or fear guilt if we don't serve, or maybe even because we want to draw attention to ourselves. I'm going to tell you this isn't here. That's probably my biggest sin. You know, I found myself, this is, I, I got a little confession to make to you all. I found myself laying in bed last night trying to go to sleep, praying about Sunday school this morning. And I realized as I was in my prayer I wasn't praying that my message would be effective. I wasn't praying that everybody would hear and understand what I was saying. I was praying for Butch. I was praying, Lord, don't let me embarrass myself. Don't want to let me look stupid up there. Help me get through this. You know, and it, it just came to me. When I was praying, and I'm thinking about what I'm, what I'm talking about this morning, boy, is that the wrong direction? Is that the wrong direction to serve the Lord? So, I will I will ask you to bear with me in that. But I just that hit me so heavy last night laying in bed that that I just needed to share it with you. They say confession's good for the soul, isn't it? Okay, we want to serve the Lord with gladness. As it says, we, we don't do this to draw attention to ourselves. 
I want, I want you to know I am so proud to be a member of a church that I think does this. Okay, we have such a wonderful, giving, loving church family here that, that I think we we do that well here. The second command on that verse is come before his presence with singing. Okay, we need to, we need to do that, and we do that here. Uh, pardon? No, I'm not going to. Well, it says come. All right. Psalm 98, hang on, Psalm 98, 4 says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Now, I can do that. If you sat in front of me, you could only describe my singing as a joyful noise. Okay. So, Chuck, Chuck hears it. So, that, I can follow that. I can make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Do you know his first three commands, God says, shout with joy, serve with gladness, and come with joyful songs. Okay, psalmist says, come before him and serve him and sing his praises with joy in your heart. Command number four, know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. God made us all. God made us all. Every bone in your body, every muscle, every tooth, everything you've got, God had a plan for each and every one of us. He made us exactly the way he wanted us to be. Don't quite understand that. And some of us look in the mirror and I go, okay, so he wanted a kind of an overweight, going gray, not quick on his, anyway. And I look at all the things I look, that look back at me in the mirror and went, okay, well, I guess this is what he wanted. So this is what he's got. So we need to understand every one of us is the way God made us, but he hasn't quit making us yet. You know, he's quit making the physical body, but he hasn't quit with us yet. All right? Do you, do you, you think he's satisfied with the, with the finished product? Can't be in my life. You think he's satisfied with my temper? You think he's satisfied with the things uh, and the sins that, that, that tempt me, that I yield to? So he's still in the process of working with us. All right, but we need to be thankful we're made, the, the, the Bible says we're made in God's image. By golly, we need to be thankful for that. All right, then he says, whoops, I'm back again. And he says, we're his people and the sheep of his pasture. All right, a lot of people want to be shepherds instead of sheep. You know, they, they, they don't want to follow. They want to be leaders. <coughs> You know, they say it's not any fun being cheap. However, the problem is we don't know where the still waters and the green pastures are by ourselves. Every time we think we do and we head out for those on our own, we end up in the desert. All right? God says, you be the sheep, let me be the shepherd, and I'll lead you beside the still waters and the green pastures. Just let me lead. We need to yield to him to do that. Okay, the next command, enter to his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. You know, in the Old Testament, the temple symbolized the presence of God. I know we all remember some of the, the diagrams and stuff that Rich has put up. We talk about the courtyards and then the inner court and the, the holy of holies and all that stuff. Whenever people in, in the old days came into the temple, they felt like they were entering the presence of God. Well, that temple is no longer around. God, we're in a different dispensation. God is with us every day. Okay, now sometimes where we meet like this is called a sanctuary, which uh, indicates that, that God is there, but he's everywhere. He's not just here. He's with you at work. He's with you at home. He's with you when you're with the kids. He's with you in the car. That's probably the place that I talk to God most often is in the car. It seems when I'm home and stuff, you know, shame on me, I get distracted by all kinds of things. When I'm driving, not that I should be distracted driving, but that's an opportunity that I have. It's just me and God, and we probably talk more when I'm in the car 
than we do at any other time. So uh, remember, he's with us everywhere. Now, why should we do all of this? All right? For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. All right? What a comfort to read those words. What a comfort. What if, you know, if, if that wasn't true, uh, what if God began to treat us the way we so often treat him? Pretty sad. What if God met our needs to the same extent that we give him our lives? What if we complained about the rain on a dismal day so God never caused any trees to grow or flowers to bloom again? You know, what if he stopped loving and caring for us because we stopped loving and caring for others? What if he didn't bless us today because we didn't thank him yesterday? We need to be thankful, as Psalm 103.10 says, we need to be thankful that God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. I hope this is going to be a great Thanksgiving for everybody. One other thing I wanted to share as I was thinking about, about a closing prayer. We've taken a couple of family cruises, as you know, with, with Michelle's family. And a couple of cruises back, we, uh, you know, we had a couple tables of us sitting in the dining room. And every night before dinner, we would all meet. We'd eat breakfast and lunch various times and places. But for dinner, we all gathered together in the dining room as a family. And there were, I think we had probably two tables most of the time. Right over, kind of across the aisle from us, was a table full of ladies. And before dinner every night, I usually said a blessing for, for our family. And we noticed these ladies who were also doing something. Sounded like they were singing. You recall? Sounded like they were singing. Well, you know, I'm kind of shy. So, <laughs> so I went up to them, and it was before they ate, and I'm figuring, well, I'm not sure what that is. So I went up, and I asked them, I said, you know, what, what are you doing? I noticed you're doing this. And they said, every night for our blessing, uh, before we eat, we sing the doxology. And I went, Wow, how good is that? So from that night, that was probably the first or second night. From that night on, that's what we did for our, before our evening meal is all three tables of us sang the doxology. Okay? And so I was thinking about this, and I said, what, what a great expression to God and an expression of thanks is, is the doxology. It, if you know it, uh, I'm just going to say it in, in the prayer. We're not going to sing it. But, huh? No, I'm not saying unless I shut the mic off. Otherwise, I'll be back to a joyful noise again. But the doxology, let's, let's pray and let me, let me give the doxology to the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Lord, that's the, that's the thanks and the message that we want to give to you. You've given us so much that we just are not worthy of, and we just want to thank you. We thank you for the progress of, with Rich. Uh, you know what a joy that is to our heart. Uh, be with Chuck as he's bringing us the service this morning. Once again, we want to thank you in this Thanksgiving season and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Thank you again for watching, and we look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Community Church.